Welcome everyone to this edition of Welcome Change. My name is Marie Ringler. I'm a member of Ashoka's Global Leadership Group, and I welcome you to this 30-minute conversation with something that I admire a lot, our wonderful Ashoka fellow, Laurent Richard. We will be talking about his work that tries to make sure that more truth gets out. And I'm really delighted to say hello to you. <laughs> hello, Marie. Yes. Thank you so much for, for having me. I'm so happy to have this uh, discussion with, uh, with you and all the people who are with us. Laurent founded Forbidden Stories in 2017, following the murder of uh, the journalist Daphne Caruana Galicia. And he's become an Ashoka Fellow in the year 2022. We're delighted to welcome you to the network. He's an investigative reporter and a social entrepreneur. And I want to start with um, a question for you, Laurent. Um, you said to me in the preparation, your target audience are the killers. Tell us more. That's true. That's, that's the one we want to convince to, uh, to not kill a journalist, actually. Uh, that's uh, as simple uh, as, as it is. It's uh, our mission with Forbidden Stories is to continue the work of uh, journalists who have been killed, who have been jailed, uh, who have been threatened, to, uh, to make sure people get access to information. And if, if the killers of journalists, if enemies of the free press start understanding that it doesn't make sense to kill reporters because otherwise you will have 50 other reporters uh, who will continue the work of the one you just silence, of the one you just kill for the same story you wanted to silence at the beginning. So it's going to be very counterproductive and that's going to be a big issue for your businesses, for your own crimes, because your own crimes will be exposed everywhere. So this is why I say during our talk, yeah, our targeting audience are the killers. Of course, we want to. We are here to talk to everybody and make sure that people get access to information. But uh, what the, the the moonshot of forbidden stories is, of course, to dissuade people to kill journalists. Mm. And so this is why we have that kind of audience with us. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to name a few of the investigations that you've led. Um, one of them was Green Blood, um, the work of you know, 13 journalists who were killed reporting on environmental crimes. Um, another one I already mentioned, continuing the work of uh, Daphne Caruana Galicia, who was, who was murdered a few years ago. Um, but also the most recent one about story, that you called Story Killers, which is yep. um, about the work of Gauri Lankesh, who was killed for her investigations. And, you know, give us a bit of a sense of where, you know, your interest in this work came from and how you understood how to build, you know, this new framework um, in order to, uh, to stop the killing of journalists. Yes, so the, the, the last project we did, as you say, was uh, the Story Killers Project. So Story Killers Project was, um, a project involving 100 journalists um, all around the world with one mission, continuing the work of Gary Lankesh. And Gary Lankesh was a journalist. She was killed in 2017. And she was investigating something that is a global threat in for our global democracies. And in every country, in France, in, in, in many parts of the world, we are all um, uh, threatened by the level of disinformation. And Gary Lankesh was investigating disinformation. She was investigating troll factories. She was investigating companies behind the disinformation. And she was killed um, in 2017 in India. And, and she was just finishing the last opinion piece. And the title of the opinion piece was In the Era of False News. And mm -hmm. she... Um, she was never able to to see the piece published. The, the piece was published two days after her killing. She was um, uh, she was shot. She was killed by by someone who was really brainwashed. People who were who wanted to kill who ordered the killing of Gary 
wanted to Gary to be killed because she was uh, she was disturbing their, their businesses. And so they showed to the killers a video like 50 times where that was a fake video about a speech of Gary that was um, that was precisely selected and and some parts were 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 aside. And and so the, the guy was brainwashed, he killed Gary. And Gary was investigating the, the fake news and the disinformation. So we decided to, to team up with a journalist from the Washington Post, from the Guardian, from Le Monde, from uh, many places all around the world to not only to continue the work of Gary in India, but also to investigate all around the world the disinformation uh, industry. And that was very important to do that, that project because according to... So we all know this information is really a threat for us, but an Oxford report published in 21, I think, uh, was able to identify um, 65 companies, private companies, working for 48 countries, 48 states, delivering this information for higher services. And so that that tells you the level of uh, of um, of of businesses of practices in uh, um, as um, as as a market, there is a market for the disinformation. So, and we know what this information is about. It's about um, influencing uh, presidential election. And we find out um, a private secret, very secret company in Israel who pretended to be behind the manipulation of more than thirty presidential election. And those guys were former guys who were working for Cambridge Analytica, who was involved in some manipulation on the Brexit in the U.S. election uh, before. And so th this is uh, what we're talking about, a global threat for democracy. So that, that, that tells you as, as, as well what our mission is. We are investigative reporters. So we are not doing any kind of advocacy. We are not here even to defend press freedom directly. But we... we and and it's not we we are not continuing the work of someone who has been killed because it's it's someone who was doing the same job and it's a like a corporation a reaction from a corporation. It's not about that. It's really about making sure people get access to the very important stories and at the end dissuading the people to kill the journalists because it doesn't make sense. So how do you do that? How do you persuade somebody not to kill? It's uh, so it's. Um, so the first answer is, is uh, I don't do that alone. <laughs> That's the key thing. The key thing is that is, is building the team, is uh, finding the partners, is building uh, yeah, a kind of uh, um, a, a, a global network. We are addressing a global crime. So we need a global answer and we need a global network. So it takes a network to tackle that. And so the network that is, is something, is, and that is something that's rather unusual, right? In in the media industry. Yeah, that's the that's really a new paradigm, actually, because the we as a journalist, when you go to journalism school, you became you want to become a journalist. At least what it was like like this, maybe twenty five years ago when I started. Like you want to become a journalist because you want to be famous for your story. You want to be along the stage with your awards, along with your in your relationship with your source, in your relationship with your editors, and 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 with your own story, your own scoop, which is great, which is necessary, which is sometimes not all the stories need a collaboration, but sometimes some stories, because of the scale, because uh, because the story and the topic is global. Because you need people in other country to have to make sure you have a good understanding of of the criminal network you are investigating, of the global environmental crime you are investigating. So you need a network to uh, address that kind of very um, um, global topic. But not only global topic; it's a very dangerous topic. It's always very dangerous. And so, how do you do that? The, the, there is many many steps in in the process. The the, the first thing is to understand who we are not and, and what and who, who we are actually. So who we are, we are just journalists. And our role is to inform the public. It's, it's publishing facts, not ideas, not opinion, facts, just facts. It's already enough to deliver facts. So, don't, so, so we, we won't provide any opinion. Uh, and so that's, 
uh, we are not doing any kind of advocacy. We are not asking the governments to investigate killing of journalists. That's not our role. That's the role of CPJ, of Reporter Without Borders, of Article 19, and that they are doing that in a very efficient way. But uh, so the the first thing we, we try to understand is to make sure that the journalists have been killed in relation to his work or her work as a journalist. So we identify that. Then we try to understand if we can make a difference, uh, if we can continue the work based on the on the story, on the country, if we have a, some conversation before is killing with the journalist and some knowledge about what was the investigation and who might be behind the killing. And then we need people and we need talents and we need an organization here, a coordination all around the world to make that possible. And and so as you say, it's not you you start to you you as a journalist, we have been trained to become lone wolf reporter. And now we're asking people to team up, uh, to work together and to and to and to be on board for a specific mission that will be very dangerous, uh, very time consuming, complex, legally challenging. And uh, and yes, and, and where you, you have to make a lot of compromise. On the other hand, you have a lot of benefits. Protection, it doesn't make sense to kill reporters if you are 80. Uh, resources, if you, you can travel to 10 countries, but you can, tra- if you, you, you can benefit from the travel of eight other reporters. So you go to two countries and then you get eight for free because that's also the business model. It is free. It's uh, and and so in terms of resources, we are splitting the work. So we here we are nonprofit, and we can go back after if you want to the funding and how to make that uh, sustainable. But in terms of business model, I think it's uh, the future of journalism is is the collaborative journalism, because we are splitting the work and and we have some rules. Uh, in the meantime, when we do partner with some people, we try to avoid to have two partners in the same country to avoid creating competition within the same territory and it brings impact as well so you are you, you can you can change something as a journalist and and i think that's very different from 25 years ago when i started now i saw because i'm, I'm teaching journalism at sciences po here in paris and i see more and more young people who want to become journalists because they want to change the society we live in. They want to be part of the change. They want to be change makers as well as a journalist. Uh, so which is very, uh, which could be tricky because you need to be kind of neutral, but you, 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 you are here as well to denounce some facts that are very crucial for the society. Tell us about the safe box mechanism, because that's really something that fascinates me. You know, it's such a simple idea um, to protect people, to protect journalists. Yes. The, so the safe box network is um, it's um, it's it's a kind of a virtual safe or journalists at risk um, are protecting, securing their ongoing investigation like if Marie, you are a Mexican journalist, and yesterday you did an interview of a corrupted governor's very dangerous guy in the Sinaloa state, you are planning to publish this story, this interview in two weeks, but maybe you will receive some threats and you are afraid about that. So you can contact us, share with us the file of the interview and tell us, I just did this interview. If anything happened to me, please continue my work. And one thing is important is to share, but the other thing that is very important is to let the people know that you have to share. If you think it can add some protection. And, and so you can tell the publicly that um, uh, for my own safety, and this is what many and more and most journalists are doing all around the world, for my own safety, I decide to share my work and my ongoing investigation with a consortium uh, that is working with 150 journalists and 60 news organizations around the world. So if anything happened to me, they will continue my story. So don't try anything that would be silly. And mm. so that's that's the idea. And and the idea is quite simple because actually, usually in a newsroom, you have an editor, a deputy editor, and a journalist. And the journalist, if 
usually the, there is a conversation between the three person. But in in Mexico, in some part of India, the most at risk journalists are the most isolated one. And and the, the journalists who are killed are always very isolated. They don't have any more newsroom because it's too dangerous. They don't have any more editor because it's too dangerous. So we want with the Safe Box Network to reconnect them, to recreate this conversation that they should have, to tell us that I'm just received some threats from that person because I'm doing a story that is about this. And 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 so this is what we are doing. And, and so last October, Rafael Moreno, a journalist in Colombia, in the north of the country, um was sharing with her some information he was he was investigating and some stories he was, he was investigating and he was receiving more and more threats mm. and and he was killed and and so and before his killing he asked her to continue his work if anything happened to him so this is why he, he wanted to to share with her some uh, some uh, ongoing work he was doing and so we we will be publishing uh, quite soon uh, the Raphael project uh, uh, because we all, of course team up with many uh, journalists in South America, but not only all around the world to continue the work of Raphael. And so this is uh, yeah this is part of our work, and the Save Box Network is really one of the um, one of the channel and one of the way we we do that. Hmm. Yeah, it didn't protect Raphael, right? Um, so it continues to be very, very dangerous. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's clearly it, it, it will never be a life insurance for people. Uh, we will never pretend that uh, uh, the killing of journalists will, of course, continue, and we we, we won't stop the killing of journalists uh, because of a single ID or a single network. It will take time to do that. And it's 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 also about changing the mindset of uh, uh, journalists, of the killers, of like if we start working together, if we start sharing more and more, if we start letting them know that it doesn't make sense, because you will see the Raphael project will exist and the story will be out, and uh, and this is what Raphael wanted as well. So yes, it will take time to 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 do that. So it's uh, uh, there is nothing magic in that, uh, and I think changing behaviors changing mindset uh, might take a generation to do that. But if we succeed in that, that's, that's about, uh, of course, preserving democracies because we know what happened to democracy or to uh, society where there is no place for journalists. Uh, there is no more democracy. So it's then the risk for all, all of us. Mm, yeah. You said uh, your goal is to change mindsets, and I think that that makes total sense, right? And I guess it's the mindsets of journalists, as you were describing, it's the mindsets of the media industry, um, um, it's the mindsets of the killers. Do you, you know, also measure your outcomes in the number of corrupt politicians who have to step down or go to prison? <laughs> yeah, we tr we try to. So we not only try, we do that every after every project. So we so we were born five years ago. Uh, so we did we did more than six or seven project, big project. After the Daphne project, the Daphne project team members were able to identify the killers of, of Daphne, uh, who was ordering the crime. Uh, people were protesting on the on the on the street. The prime minister were forced to resign. Uh, after the Pegasus project. Many things happen all around the world. The, the U.S. Department of Commerce decided to blacklist the company Enso Group, that is the the company that is selling the spyware called uh, Pegasus. Uh, but the European Parliament decided to launch um, um, an inquiry, an official inquiry, a committee inquiry to investigate uh, abuses of of the spyware all around the EU and all around the world. And so, yet there is. Sometimes it could be disappointed, of course, as a journalist, because okay, you are publishing your stories, it's a scandal, and then nothing happened, and then another scandal will 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 be on the on the news. But I think it's that kind of project when you are publishing at once um, with sixty or new other news organization, you are that's a good way to create a conversation, mm -hmm. and and not only in one country but uh, all around the world. 
So it's it's not that easy, um, but it's um, it's uh, it's it's a way for we are monitoring what is happening in the civil society after that. But the very first thing that we are looking just in terms of impact and evaluating impact, which is the most difficult uh, thing, as you know, maybe better than me about how to how to in a very honest way to talk about your own impact. And basically what we do, and it's it's it's, uh, it's it's maybe not more directly about the impact, but it's more about the um, the uh, well, it's a kind of impact as well, because you know, I always take the example of Daphne Kawana Galiza. So Daphne was a journalist in Malta, she was killed in 2017. She was one of the very last independent voices in this tiny island that is part of the EU as uh, EU um, uh, that is the EU member, sorry. And Daphne was publishing stories about corruption, money laundering uh, on her blog, and she was having 300,000 uh, uh, visitor per month, which is really big in Malta because there are only 400,000 people living there. And, and so that was quite big. But then when we were, so she was killed. And nobody was really aware about the level of corruption in Malta, even in Europe. Uh, in the US, they even did, didn't know that Malta was part of the EU or was uh, confused about what is this country. And, and, and we were teaming up with the New York Times, with, uh, with uh, Le Monde, with The Garden, with the journalists in India, in New Zealand. And, and I think for the very first time, we talk all around the world about the corruption in Malta. So precisely the, the, the story they wanted to silence at the beginning, corruption of, the, of two guys, member of the government of, uh, of, of, of the Maltese authorities. And uh, with precision, pre precisely identifying the offshore company that, where they were receiving some funds to corrupt and to bribe other people. And so, and, and so after that, we asked Kanta, the, 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 the company that is monitoring the, the level of reach and the, uh, the, the rate of the audience. And, and we find out that 74 millions of people have been uh, 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 rich by the story, reach out by the story of the Daphne project, thanks to the, the 45 journalists and 18 news organizations. So that means from 300,000 people were only reading the stories of Daphne, and then we have 74 millions of people reading this very same story they wanted to silence. So this is our work, is to amplify what you wanted to silence. And, and so this is a good way to say that it's counterproductive to kill a journalist. Yeah. Uh, one of our uh, members of the audience is asking, what can I do as an ordinary citizen to support investigative journalism? Um, there is one thing that is quite easy, simple, fast, is to click on donate. <laughs> uh, that is, and it's always uh, impactful. To click is always impactful because we are a nonprofit, so that's good. That's very important to tell. It's not um, we don't have a, a shareholder that is behind that. It's nonprofit based in France. Uh, we are funded by philanthropic foundation and by individual donation. So a part of my job, a large part of my job, is to raise uh, money and to convince people to to help us um, to help us as an. Uh, as a society for democracy to help us doing our job and continuing the work of assassinated reporters. And so one way to, to, to help us is to contribute. And, and the other way that is as important as the first one is to let your friends, your neighbors know that we are here. And uh, so it's, I think it's, it's really about that, that when you like something, when you support something, when something is important for you, Start talking about that to your kids, to your neighbors, people around you, to the teacher of your kids, and 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 um, yeah, that's a, that's a conversation. Mm, yeah, one of our uh, members of the audience is asking, "What brings you energy and hope?" Um, 
so the I think uh, yes, yeah, some honestly sometimes it's difficult because uh, you because it's because it's dangerous because you are assessing the risk of people of your team and you don't want to endanger them. So we are always under high pressure, and 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 yeah, and evaluating, taking decision about very important decision. Uh, that uh, that could uh, yeah that could lead to the death of someone of your team and and you are we are always in contact with people who are highly under threat and we and and so that's a lot of pressure the but there is a lot of energy and there is a lot of hope. the energy for me so uh, I used to be so and I'm still of course a journalist but I was producing my own documentaries or. And now, since I start, I created Forbidden Stories, and I I spend my day meeting people with a, that who are bringing energy, <laughs> and that is this is what is great. I think in the in the social entrepreneur path, where at some point we don't know where we are, we need to be very ambitious because otherwise it won't work. And but you are always meeting people who. Who uh, I think want to, yeah, to be part of this uh, uh, change-making movement, where you you know that it's going to be a collaboration, and mm. so the energy is coming from that, from the people. The hope is is coming from uh, the conversation we do have, and I do have that kind of conversation frequently. The hope is coming from the conversation, the tone and the eyes and what is happening when you're talking to a journalist in Mexico who say that, yeah, I feel even even if I'm killed tomorrow, I feel not anymore alone because there is someone behind me. There is someone on my back. So there is so hope is coming from is coming from that kind of very uh very, very short moment. Uh conversation that you can might have after three hours of workshop of um and you can see that it's the i think the question is and the end the question should be much more asked to them to people who are really at risk here i'm not at risk i'm in the middle of paris uh so that's fine but um but uh, yeah so energy and hope uh are still there mm, yeah that's that's beautiful. <laughs> so really what you're doing is you're not only changing mindsets, you're creating collaboration, you're creating trust, right? You're creating trust in a very fragmented system that has lost trust in also many of our institutions in the world. Yes, it's it, trust is a key word as well because for us we so our um the way we do that is only based on the fact that w- when we are teaming up, we have to share our information with another person. And that person was uh, sometimes your competitor the day before and will be your competitor the day after because you're work partnering between newspapers. So you need something that is called trust uh, to, to work with the person. Uh, you need some trust as well when you are very at risk and you share your your ongoing investigation with someone you don't know that is living far away so this is uh, this is why we have to uh, to show what we are to explain the methodology who we are the standards we are uh, what kind of partners we do have um this is why we we wait a little bit uh, before launching the safe box network before asking the people who are at risk to share information with us because I thought at the beginning they should know about us and we should take time to build a solid network with high standards in journalism as well and to avoid mistakes as well as much as we can so we can trigger some uh, some trust and and based on our conversation and the how to expand our network based on that trust as well um so this is uh, yeah this is key Thank you so much for your very important work, Laurent, not only to protect journalists, but to protect democracy. We're really honored to have you as part of our Ashoka Fellowship, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much, and thank you for uh, all you do with uh, with the Ashoka. That's th that kind of uh, support is is really another network helping another network is really very great. When networks are meeting, that's uh, always better. Thank you, and goodbye.